All right, Father, we love you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for the family. Lord, as we come together in your name, Lord, just to learn more about you and the lands of the Bible. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I really should spend another, you know, several weeks in Jerusalem. Love Jerusalem, right? Love, love the area of Jerusalem. But, but we've already covered all the, the walls of Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem. We covered the Temple Mount. We covered what the buildings are. Um, we covered um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We covered uh, the different zone, the different areas in Jerusalem. One more place that you cannot go to Jerusalem without at least popping in is, and you really need a whole day at least, is this building right here, which is the Israeli Museum. The Israeli Museum is one of the hot spots of Jerusalem because of all their artifacts and all the things that they find every time that they dig. I was telling Jim about, uh, before the service, about a family that we met several years ago. They bought, a, they bought an apartment, uh, but they bought it like more like a condo in downtown Jerusalem. And, uh, and so in their four they, du- they got inside there and sneakily dug straight down and did their own archaeology and found some major ruins. Now, because we had connections, we knew them, we were able to go in there and go and see the ruins they have in their house. That's, you know, because you, anywhere you dig, you find things, right? So, but the Israel Museum has so much there, but let me just tell you some of the highlights of it. This is the shrine of the book. This is the, the, the outward of the building it, they shaped it like the lid on one of the jars of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which you'll see back there in the case back there. And as you go down in this, this is where they house uh, it, Israel's. See, Israel has a large collection, and Jordan has a large collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right? And, then, uh, and then there's some pieces, there's small pieces, but then great reproductions of the Dead Sea Scrolls now in Washington, D.C., in the Bible Museum. So if you ever get to Washington, D.C., you absolutely want to go there. But uh, yeah, it's, what's that? It is very cool. I thought you said it's free. It's not free. It's expensive, but, but it is very cool. Um, so, and this, I'm going to hit just, just really fast right now. And then next time or the time after, when we get over to Qumran, we'll talk more about the Dead Sea Scrolls. But in 1947, there was a kid that was, and I'll show you the cave next time. Uh, there was a kid that was, he's watching his, his sheep and goats that you'll see um, on, uh, on, in fact, I'll show, I'll show a little bit of those, but the sheep and goats. And so, uh, he, but he was, he was just, he saw that up at the top, there was a hole where there had been, a, there was a cave. And so he's chasing his sheep up this hill and he takes a rock and he throws it through that opening and he hears, he, he hears a jar breaking. And that was 1947, that began this great frenzy, and it's a long story, I'll tell you more next time, uh, of, of finding the scrolls. If it wasn't for him just throwing his rock in there, and there's stories that say, well, one of his sheep, he was looking for a sheep. No, none of that's true. This hole was up. The sheep went and got in there. He was, just, he was just messing around, threw a rock in there, and it busted one of these jars, and in there where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, from there, they found not only just that one cave, but they found t- 12 caves right, with over 900 manuscripts. The entire Old Testament was found with multiple volumes with the exception of one for sure, maybe two books were not. What are those books? Stay tuned, I'll get all that. And I will talk about why they weren't there. Okay, so you go inside. It looks like being inside of a jar. It's kind of cool how they did it. And then, uh, and then they have the displays all around. This is the famous Isaiah scroll. Uh, we had, we had, and I could have had, this was dumb. I could have, would have, should have had a scroll. If you have been with us for a very long time, I did a Bible, we did a Bible event over the weekend. Uh, we rented a high school, did a big Bible event, taught about Bibles, ancient Bibles and all that. And I had an, I had an Isaiah scroll, a perfect duplicate of that, that it was, in fact, it was, it was soon that we were in this building that I laid it out here, and we, 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 from that end to this end, laid it out so you could see it. Does, does anybody remember that? Was anybody there? Where did they go? People died and went to heaven, I guess. So, um, but the cool thing about this Isaiah scroll, now what they have on display, you'll notice this when you get there, is a, um, is, is a photographic 
image of it. It's not the original. The original is a, is a national treasure. Every once in a while, they'll bring that out to where we can see it. And that's, that was just probably three years ago they had it out where you could see it. And it's heavily guarded when they have it out. You have a guard on each end and you cannot get near it to touch it because it's a national treasure. Here you have this. And what's really cool when you go there, especially if, you got, if you're in there with a, with a school group, they will be there with their Hebrew Bibles and they'll be looking at it and, and it, reads, it reads line by line what they have today in their Hebrew Bibles. It's the same text. And this, this predates Jesus, right? This is this, this, uh, this scroll. And so what we have is extremely accurate for, is in our Bibles, right? And so there's a, couple, there's a couple things in here. There's a couple lines in here that are, they're, they're, it's a different wording. That, that is fascinating. Maybe we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls when, I, when we get there and talk about that in earnest. Maybe I'll show you some of those because it's very cool. But this is the community right here, the Qumran community that was the, the guys that were the, the scriptorians. These were the guys that were copying the, they, you know, having the original and copying the, um, the actual text. And so and they were very, very diligent. They do not, now if you're going to copy, say you're going to copy a book or a, or a letter or something, you'll, you'll read the line and then, then write the line. They didn't do that. They actually did not do, they did not even do word by word. They did letter by letter, letter by letter, right? And then the way they checked it was this original manuscript has X amount of words in it. This manuscript has X amount of words. It better have the exact same amount of words in it or you dropped a word or added a word. And they knew what the center word was. The center word of this scroll needs to be the exact center word of this, this scroll. Okay, you know, 400 letters into it. Uh, 400 words into it, it needs to be this word. This needs to be this word. And that's how, that's how they, they were so diligent to check it. If it had some errors, and some of them did, that had dead copyist errors, it would be tagged as a student copy. And you see some of those out there. You'll see some of those in when they find manuscripts. You'll see where they, they correct things and do different things. And you know that's not a, a, a kosher scroll, as it were. And so this is where those, those uh, the, the Essenes were at, okay, the ones that are, that were there. We'll, we'll talk about that. We have friends that are, we have uh, uh, American friends that are digging here. Okay, Randall Price, long-term friend, is probably the only American that's allowed to dig over there. If you were with me, was it two trips back? One of the, only one of the groups, that was the year I had back-to-back -back groups, only one of the groups got to meet Randall. He was at, he was at Qumran doing some digs, and I had him come on the bus and talk to you guys. Anybody, anybody on that trip? Where Randall Price came on the trip? Wasn't that good? See, that's a once-in-a-lifetime. You should have paid extra for that. That was awesome. All right, so. Okay, so the caves. This is the, this is the most uh, picturesque cave. There's two caves there uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and I'll tell you why they were hidden there and what happened. But that is, that's just a little taste because I do want to spend some time on that here. Probably, it, it may be next time we'll get that far. Uh, but definitely within the next two times, we'll get, to, we'll get to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls even more. If you want to kind of get a flavor for it, back there on that back wall, you'll see, the, you'll see the exact replicas of the jars that were found. Those jars I had custom made in a kibbutz in Nazareth made those for us. And so that, and you'll see some actually what the scrolls look like. And so, uh, very cool. So that's, that's one of the displays there at the Israeli Museum. Also, I'm not going to do a lot on this. This is a, a model city of Jerusalem from the time of Jesus that, that you have there. And, uh, and if you go there, this is breathtaking to see. And this is always changing. Uh, if they find a discovery, they change the model according to the discovery, right? This is an area that's under dispute. Was there, there appears to be a horse track right here, but they're not sure. So, so one year you go there, there was a horse track there. You come back this last year, it's gone because they're not sure what they found there. And so this is kind of, this is kind of, and, and why, they, why they believe there was one there, because Josephus says there is one there. There is some archaeological evidence, but it doesn't fit the, what was going on in that area. So, there's, there, so, that's, so this is one of the, the areas of dispute. They're still not sure what's there. Most of this is exactly, when there's a house, there's a house there. Okay, and so this is, this is an exact replica of what it would look like. And, and, uh, and the people in Jesus' day were really little. Really little people, you know, okay, so, cool. 
So this is the this really was in the this was in the parking lot, and this is this is historians that do this. This was in the parking lot of the Hollywood. It's it's called the Hollywood Hotel. They're in Jerusalem for years and years and years. They took it apart section by section and moved it here. So if you went to Israel fit, probably 20 years ago and before, you did not see it here. You saw it in that parking lot in that hotel. Probably you guys probably went over with Chuck Smith and saw it there in that hotel, in the whole hotel parking lot. So, uh, but this is a major, you know, we used to be able to walk on this. I used to teach standing in this thing. All right? I used to be able to stand on this and you could stand there and the thing was crumbling. And, and uh, anyways, so let's get up into the Israeli Museum just for a little bit and see, because this is the coolest museum in the entire world, right? I mean, so much that, you know, this is what the tomb looks, some of the tombs look like when they got into them. This is, now some of this stuff you should already recognize, all right? That is, what is this? This is called the Pontius Pilate. Yeah, you're reading the line there. This is the, this is the, this is the Pontius Pilate stone. This is the stone that was found at Caesarea, remember? Okay, so you have this. This, the original is in the Israeli Museum there. I have touched this. I have licked the edge of that. Okay, so <laughs> Israeli Museum, you used to be able to just wander around. Now it's really guarded, and especially some of the stuff. You used to be able to run around, touch stuff, and though you weren't supposed to, I always did. Um, stuff like this, this is, this, is, uh, uh, talks, this is about, this lets us know about our Bible story, about why God did not allow them to go from Egypt if you look at the, and I've talked to you guys about this before, especially in our Genesis study, is the way to go from when, when God had them uh, with Moses leave Egypt and go to the promised land, they should have got, they got, got leave, leave Egypt, kind of go around this little area right here. They should have took a left because that takes you right to the promised land. Instead, they take a hard right. It's exactly the wrong direction. It doesn't make sense why God had them do it until this was discovered. This is a burial ground for the Philistines. And the Philistines, and this is from the time of Moses, they were a superpower right there. If they had to take a left, they had to go right into that community. They had got, they had got slaughtered. And it, it helps us understand our Bibles even more. So you look at this going, okay, so these came from that area. This is why God had them go in a specific direction. Okay, so the, so the archaeology in the Bible uh, sometimes archaeology helps you understand these Bible stories. Why did that take place that way? You know, um, you know. So I mean, there's a lot of stories like that. Jeruz uh, Jericho is a famous one about how does that story come alive? And we talked about. Remember talking about Jericho? How the walls felt directly down when they excavated? What did they see? What does the Bible say? It. It. The Bible says they went straight up into the city. The walls fell straight down, made a ramp for them to go straight up in the city. And so you just look at this going, well, that totally makes sense. And so the, these different sites. Also this, now this, we have a copy of this or the original, depends on how you look at it, uh, of this box. This is, who's in, who was in this box? Caiaphas. Caiaphas' bone box, right? Ours was very weird for a long time. Only, this, only some of the staff know this. This, this lid... The lid on ours, and the lid on this one, by the way, is glued down. Okay, it is solidly glued down, all right? I just know that, all right? <laughs> and I did not know this. This is, They moved it to a new location when it was at the other location. They had a camera on that section because I, I, I'm going to get that lid off. I have got to look in this thing, so I'm trying to get the lid off. And, man, they were on me like that. It was like, you guys are so good. He goes, you can't get the lid off of that. Uh, it's glued down. And he says, do you notice that it's broken along the top? Yeah. How, how, that, how, how, how did that happen? Well, a person just like you tried to slide the lid off. Go, well, that's a bummer. Ours here, ours here, remember this? I don't know if it's still doing. Ours was, ours was slowly moving off of there. It was moving. It was actually, the, the lid was moving. I was waiting for a little skeletal hand to come out. <laughs> that was weird. Caiaphas is bone, but I already told you the story of that. Go back and online, you can watch that, of how that was found. That is very cool. So many things. I mean, we could really spend a lot of time, uh, room by room, talking about what's in the Israeli Museum. But, uh, you know, the, Dave, the, the, the um, David Stone, this says the, the kingdom of David, found in, anybody remember where this was found? Up in, all, very good, up in Dan. 
cuneiform tablets. I've had tons of these over the years. And you'll see some, uh, in fact, I get, my daughter teaches history and I, and I have one at home. I didn't bring it here because it's weird history. It is, how, it is a, it's a little tablet and it's, it's, uh, it tells you how to make beer. It's called the beer tablet, which is very cool. I said, take this to your class and show your kids. And she did. Hadrian, um, a lot of Bible texts are there. This bone right here, this is, this is a young man that was crucified. And, they, and the nail, you notice that the nail, it's not a good, you can't see the whole thing. When the nail went through, went through the heel, when it got into the wood, it turned. It, it must have hit a knot, turned. So they could not uh, pull the nail out to get the man off the cross. So instead they cut the cross and, and, and you can see the heel bone, evidence of crucifixion from the time of Jesus. This, this, bone, this, bone, right, this bone with the little nail in it is in that room over there. Go look at that room over there. Right? That's exact, it looks weird. That's an exact replica made by the Israeli Museum. Uh, and there's probably, I, guess you're, I guarantee you, there's not another one in the United States that, of that little bone, of an exact replica of that little bone. This is interesting. Go look at this. This, this, little, this little thing is on the, it, it was supposed to be on the top of a staff, you know, and it's holiness to the Lord and, and all this. And they spent, they spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this. And they found, and this was a prize of the Israeli Museum. If you're at the Israeli Museum back in back 15 years ago, when you first walked in, this was the prize of that. This was like, because ah, this is from the time of Solomon. And then they found out it's a fake, you know. And so it's one of those things. And so, and I think the guy that sold it to him died, so they couldn't even go back after him. All right. So, anyway, so that's it's an interesting story. Interesting. The uh, uh, the guy that owns it now is Biblical Archeology, Biblical Archaeology Review guy uh, that, that, that owned that magazine. I don't know if he's still alive, but he's the guy that actually purchased it, purchased it from them and owns it because they didn't want it. It's like, okay, it's, it's fake. All right, so Yad Vashem is one, is one, one more place that we'll get out of here, Yad, far, far as out of Jerusalem. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum. You cannot go to Israel without going to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, there, the one in D.C. is is hard to walk through. There's others throughout the world. Um, Washington D.C. is probably Washington D.C. and this one are the two that that every person should have to go to one time. When you go here, when you go to this, when you go to the Yad Vashem, the the memorial for for the Holocaust, is you'll see soldiers there almost every time, because this is part of their training. They'll go there and they'll 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 go through every single room. Every, they'll, they'll, spend, they'll spend hours and hours and hours there for, for their training to learn, to, to learn about what happened at the Holocaust. Very, so I'm not going to get into a lot of this stuff. The, this is probably the most gripping part of it is the, is the child memorial. It's the memorial. 1.5 million children died in the Holocaust. And, and um, you see these, these little, these are pillars that are broken off, you know, talking about the children that, that were were young and they were they were broken off at such a such a young age. What's so gripping about this? This is the the family that actually funded this. Their son died in the Holocaust. This is a picture of their son. What's just amazing about this is you go into this room, and it's really dark. You got to hold on to the rail to get through it. And this is this is all. And and they are reading. And I've forgotten how long it takes. It takes you know like a year to go through this or better to read. You read. They read the name of the child, the age of the child and where that child was from that died in the Holocaust. And it's just, it's just going, this, this, so you hear this name, the age, the location. The name, the age, the location. This room right here, and it's, it's pitch dark when you're going in there, and then you come around a corner, and this is what you see just as far as you can see these lights. This is only done by five candles. There's five candles, and everything else is mirrors in there. And it is, it is, it is hard not to go through this section of it and not just just weep to, to understand what happened. For those that would say there's no Holocaust, on it, they should be made to go through something like this to see this is what happened. Right? You can't go to Israel without understanding the history of Israel. This is part of their history, you know, in the, the museum there. One of the cool things about that, though, is on the outside of this, is the is the trees of all the faithful. All right, this is those that helped those those that were escaping 
you know, uh, harm's way. And here you have all these trees with the stories of, you know, Oscar Schindler. We, we obviously know that one from Schindler's List movie. And so there are all, and all these trees, this is cool. All these trees are all the same size because they're planted all at the same time. Except one tree is, is small. This is, this is Corey Ten Boom's tree. Her tree was planted. Look at these trees. This is, they were all planted exactly the same time when they did this. Her tree is, it was exactly the same size. On the year that she died, her tree died. And so now, now I want to know if that's legend or if that's true. We were able to get a couple times back to get the main curator, the, the guy that runs this museum. I was able to get him to come out and we sent all you guys in the museum. And then, then, then just a handful of us was able to go through with a little private tour. And when we got over here, asked him about this. And he said, yes, I was here when that tree died. That tree died when Corey died. That same year she died, mysteriously that tree just died. And we had to replant it. Isn't that cool? You know, Corey Tim Boom, what a, what a giant of the faith. By the way, I'm trying to work it out again. You will meet her here on a Wednesday night coming up. I'm trying to get her to come here, uh, which is very cool. She was here about, um, some of you are going, what are you talking about? She was here about probably five years ago. I had her do a Wednesday night. Anybody here when Corey Tim Boom did a Wednesday night? See, he wasn't that good. Good, a couple of you were here. That's very cool. Now this is, Corey Tim Boom's been dead for years. This is an actress that comes in and what would it be like to have an evening with Corey Tim Boom? And she's out doing it, she's out traveling again. She just started traveling again. And I contacted her about three days ago, said, hey, you're out there doing it again. Come on, sister, get over here. We need you, we need Corey back, All right? So if you don't know who Corey Tim Boom is, watch, watch our, our advertisement for the church and we'll put that on there. You, that's one you do not want to miss. It was tonight. Uh, get the movie, the, uh, the Hiding Place. You want to get that back to the hiding place? So, so get the movie, The Hiding Place, right? So, okay. Yeah, we're, there's no way. I had 120 slides for you tonight. There's zero chance we're going to do that. And I need to slow it down anyways. We're going too fast. It felt a little fast last time. Did it feel fast to you guys? You guys don't even remember last time, do you? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's move. Okay, now we're going to go, we're going to go into Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Only, it's only six miles. It's right there. If you know how to, you know where to look in Jerusalem, you can see Bethlehem. It's right there. And, and for years, this, you see Bethlehem, Rachel's tomb, uh, Herodium that we'll, we'll get to tonight. And so uh, for years, we used to go to Bethlehem and, uh, and, and hang out with the people, the shepherd, Bedouin shepherds that were out there, the families that were out there. For years, it was kind of a peaceful place to go, especially on the outskirts. This is a family that we went every year. We spent time with this family uh, that, that had these sheep and goats. We, we, uh, every time we'd stop, we watched this little girl was growing up, you know, and she'd come out there. We'd give her candy and coins. We'd talk to them. It was such a joy. I was sitting there, and, uh, and this, this little this guy right here was eating that green piece of plastic. I'm sitting there. And th right there, this, this dude is sizing me up, right? And then he, within, with, literally within probably 10 seconds of this picture, this, this sheep came up, walked up to me, and took a big old bite out of my leg. <laughs> you know? I thumped that thing at the top of the head. I looked at the shepherd guy, and he was busting up laughing. Look at that stupid American, you know? <laughs> so we used to go to this same used to go to this same uh, field and uh, we had an Israeli guide that was with us. And, and so the Israeli guide was, was telling the story, telling the story about the family, telling the story about this is the field. Uh, this, right here, you can see the fields. This is the field that David would have been, Ruth and Boaz and all the stories in our Bible. This field right here would have been where those, field, where that, those events took place. While that was going on, I peeled off with a couple of the young guys and I said, I said, let's go over here. And then let these guys just go do your thing. And, and we went over there and we found this, we found a well, you know, and it was like cool there feeding the animals and stuff at the well. And so we opened this thing up and got water out of it. And I was with this kid right here. And I said, hey, take a drink of that. This is the well that David drank out of. This is the well that, is, that, that, that has so much history. 
Ruth and Boaz, all these stories in this well. So he took a drink and then I took a drink. And then the guy came over and he goes, these wells right here, uh, uh, please do not drink the water out of these wells. They don't have septic, sec- septic systems in here and any kind of sewer stuff goes into this. And if you drink these, you'll get really sick. And I went, ah. <laughs> that young kid, that young kid on the way, we had, a, we had a, a layover in London on the way back. That kid went to the hospital because of that in London. And uh, I, nothing, nothing. I was fine. I'd been eating my wife's cooking for so long that I had no problem whatsoever, <laughs> all right? So, yeah, not at all, which is weird because he got really sick and I didn't get sick. So I just, but it was, it was really good. It was really good. Yeah, it used to be such a beautiful, it used to be such a beautiful area. I mean, you'd go out there, you'd see them out there working in the field, you'd see the animals, you see things like this. A lot of this is, you'll, you can still see some of this, the remnants of this, but not around Bethlehem, a lot of this is gone now. But this is, this is actually a pen, all right, a sheep pen. Here you have the shepherd, there's the door. I am the door of the sheep pen. The, the shepherd would lay across this at night because the sheep won't step over him and animals won't come in, so he's protecting them. And some of the, some of the, the illustrations that Jesus gave came from, from scenes like this. The problem is, is that between 2002, 2004 and there, uh, this happened. This wall was put up, all right? Now, now the thing is this, the, the, whatever, your, whatever the, the thought is about these, this, this wall here, uh, it had to happen. There was no other way to solve the suicide bomber problem. These suicide bombers were coming from Bethlehem, going into the city. and blow- Remember, they were blowing up the buses. They were blowing up uh, restaurants. And the suicide bombers, was, it, was, it was a nightmare to go. When we would go to Israel, we tried to stay out of the big meeting places. You're not going to get on a bus except our bus. You're not going to get on a public bus, public transit. You don't want to go into a restaurant there was a restaurant that was where we used to go a lot that had kind of a closed in, it was a, a kind of a plastic closed in area. It was kind of a real, um, really cool ambiance thing. And the guy drives his scooter in there, in through that door and blows up and kills about half the people in that restaurant. All right, that was a restaurant we went to all the time, all right, when we were in Israel. So this, so this, there had to be an answer for that. The only answer they could say is, and this is what they were saying, if you're going to act like animals, we've got to treat you like animals. Yasser, Yasser Afrat was, uh, was alive back then, and he was giving them money. He was giving the families money, that, and actually American money even, giving them money to the families of the suicide bombers. So if you, if you, you guys are in poverty, you want to do well, suicide bomber, and we'll, we'll give your money. You'll get, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give your, your parents in that. We'll give them all this money, and we'll give them a house to live in all that. And if you remember what was going on, Israel was going in, and if a suicide bomber happened, they went to their parents' house and they bulldozed down their house because that house was a gift for that suicide bombing. The, the American news media that's completely insane was showing that going, look what Israel was doing. Oh, they're bulldozing down these poor people's houses. They would not tell the story of why they're doing that. And you know what? That right there slowed it way down. This, that right there completely stopped it, All right? There was hundreds of attempts in the first year trying to get through that wall with, with the suicide belts, right? Hundreds of, of attempts. And there was a lot at the, at the, at the border where, where they have the gates. There was a lot of ones that blew themselves up right there, right? If you remember in the early days of this, but when's the last time you heard about a suicide bomber in Israel? It's, it's, it's done. You know why? That's why right there, all right? And I don't want to get political because this is a nightmare for everybody, this is a complete nightmare for everybody. You do not want to live in Bethlehem. You don't want to live, you don't want to live, in, you know, Bethlehem is probably the worst area for being, there's some, there's some places, um, there is a village that's in uh, kind of the, near Samaria that is, that is also um, fenced in. Uh, that is, man, you don't, want to go, you don't want to go there. That's a really rough area. This has a lot of families. There's some Christians there's some, there's some Christians that are here. This is, uh, this is still a pretty rough area, though. Bethlehem, right? So it's changed a lot and from Jesus' day, obviously. And you see, you get, you get to the place here where you have 
the church of the nativity. The church, once holy, always holy. The church is over a cave of the nativity. Why do we know that's the place? Because that is the place they're making pilgrimages. That's where they have the graffiti. All the stuff we talk about in the church of the Holy Sepulchre, same thing here. Helena was the one. Remember, remember who Helena is? Helena, who's, who's her son? Her son is Constantine the Great. So Constantine the Great, when he came into power, his mom, uh, really Jesus-loving, Bible-believing, you know, what they had as far as the Bible, they, she was a Christian. So she got over there, and so she was the one that they gave the approval for these buildings. So this, this is the, and you can't see much here, but this is the entrance to the church, which is cool because they've done a remodel with it, just like they did the Church of the Sepulchre. But you see this, this is the, this is the gate of humility, because it is. If you're a fat guy, this is way humility, because it is hard to get. That little gate is like, is about that high. You really have to scratch down. You didn't even have to bend over. You just walk right straight in. Little people get through this. But man, it's hard. I always, I always have to take a breath and get down and really to get through this thing. You know why they did this? This was a double gate in the day. The reason why they did this is because, because all of these crusaders and after crusaders were riding their horses in here. They just ride their horse straight in. And so this, was, this, was how, this is how they solved it to stop the horses from coming into the church. Right? And so they have this little gate. So you get in there. It looks nothing like it would have been Jesus' day. Where This is the place where Jesus was born, uh, um, most likely. But here's what it used to look like. Man, you know that these pillars have beautiful uh, paintings on them. You know that there's mosaics up here and all this, but you couldn't see it. It was just all darked out from all the age. So what they did is they, 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 uh, they kept it open. They should have closed it because we went there one year it might have been like the last time, and it was insane trying to trying to get in there because it was just all the construction stuff. And so, but now they've reopened it. Now you see the beauty of what was underneath all that soot, all the years. This is from Crusader era. You know, all that soot you see on the pillars. You can now see. This is a terrible picture. I, I need to get a better picture of this. You can now see the images that are there, and it really it's really beautiful to see all the history of this place. But this is just, you're just making your way past this because where you're trying to get to is underneath this platform right there. And that is, that is the altar that's over the cave that, and, and there's no reason to believe that, that this is not the cave that Jesus was born in, but it's been, seg- it's been separated because there's two churches that are fighting over it. You, know, you see some of the mosaics, but you go down, go down the stairs, go to the, go to the altar, go to the top, go down the stairs and you go around and you're really in a cave, but it's, it's kind of hard to see where, where you're at. And this is where you're after. You're after this star right here. I don't know how they know exactly where it took place, but that's how they're marking it. And this is, this is looking one way of this. Now, there's a wall, and there's, a, there's a, the rest of the cave. Another church has that. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And you, you look around, you notice there's been fires. There's been various things that, that's happened in this. But this is, the, this is the spot that people are heading towards. Is this, is this star right here. And again, this is supposedly where the birth took place. Who knows? Somewhere in that cave, it would, it's probably where he was born. There, they've got the little, the little manger, the little feeding trough there. You go on the back side of this, you kind of get a better idea. The Catholics have this, this section. And you look, and they kinda, you kind of get more of a feel for what, the, what it was. It was a cave, is what it was. Jesus was born in a barn. No, he was born in a cave. It was a cave, all right? So it was more of, a, you, know, a, you know, it was a cave. So, all right, so that's cool. So you come out of this thing. Jerome, if you, know, if you know who Jerome is, if you don't know, you ought to be reading all around the walls here. Jerome is the one that he, he translated the Bible into the Latin, the Latin Vulgate. It was the Latin translation. He's the one that did that in the 300s. He lived, there's, there's a statue of Jerome right there. He lived... This is called Jerome's study. He lived underneath in one of the caves underneath the, uh, the church there. And this is where Jerome was at. Lots of, he's a major player for how we got the English Bible. He's a major player for uh, Bible translations, right? And so, um, and again, uh, if you look at, I think it's probably, um, it may be, I can't see that that well. I think it's maybe that second one over there. It's, it's, it's within those, those three right there, as you'll see. I think it's that first or second one. We'll talk about Jerome and the Latin Vulgate. 
all right? There's, there's fanciful stories that are interesting. In this cave with him was a lion, all right? And you maybe heard the story. You know, it's got Aesop's fables kind of picked up on some of this. But, but here you have, a, you have a lion in here and he became friends with the lion because the lion had a big, a big thing in his paw and he pulled the thing out of the paw and he became like his pet lion. So when you go in there, uh, you'll see the, the lion was protecting him and all this stuff. There's all those stories. He might have had a pet lion, who knows? Um, it's just a weird story. But the main thing about Jerome is the, him translating the Bible into the Latin. Um, and why he did that, just read that over there. It's too long of a story, all right? So um, we used to be, we used to go, this was the best place before they put the wall in and it got so hostile. Uh, this used to be the best place for olive wood, right? So some of you bought olive wood there. It's now not one of the best places. Super, they are very aggressive. And if you've been with us in the last five years, I don't like going here anymore. They are way too aggressive and way too overpriced, okay? It didn't used to be that way. What happened is the owner of this shop was a friend of ours. He was a friend of all of ours, a believer in Jesus. And man, he was, he always come out and George would always come out and he'd sing to us and, and he had talked to us about his life in, in Bethlehem and all that. He died, his sons took it over and, and ruined that business. So I, if I take you to Bethlehem now, I don't like taking you to this shop, all right? This is what it used to look like. It's, it's now a big mazer supermarket looking thing. But you got to be beware, buyer beware, you know, even there, you know, yeah, they're handmade on a lathe that's computerized. And so, yeah, so they say, you know, this was handmade. Well, yeah, you know, they, they did knock the burrs off at handmade. But this is really, I got down there and got some pictures of these guys doing this. And it's like, yeah, that, that really looks like a one of a kind, you know, so... It is cool to have, have some items from Bethlehem. If you look out in the case out there, uh, in this shop, in this era, I went down there and I grabbed, I just told him, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go take some of your stuff. And, and uh, he didn't care, you take, take whatever you want. I don't want any of this stuff. I wanted a piece of olive, uh, olive wood that you're gonna turn into this. So in that case, one of those cases out there has a piece of olive branch from from Bethlehem that they cut, was getting ready to put it on one of these lays, and I grabbed it, and so it's a piece about that big. I actually got about 10 of them. I just grabbed a whole bunch of them. I gave, I gave them all away except that one out there, and you'll see it out there. All right, Bethlehem. All right, you guys doing okay? This is, this is kind of fast-paced, but Bethlehem, there's a lot to see and a lot just to blow past there in Bethlehem. This is one you're already familiar with. That Look at that mountain right there. That mountain is not a real mountain. That mountain is man-made. And the person that made that is buried on that mountain. And, is, and you heard about him on Sunday morning back, I don't know, back a month ago, two months ago, uh, on that mountain. And who's buried? Who's buried? Who's buried like right here? Herod the Great. Herod the Great. That's right. Amen to that. Herod the Great. And he had his palace up there. Now, we had been up there a couple times uh, with Dr. Randall Price. And, uh, and you can go through it. You can go through the areas that they let tourists through and they got other areas where they don't let you through. We had been all through there. It's my lovely wife back, that was 20 years ago, uh, going through there. But what, ha what, what everyone was looking for was trying to find Herod's tomb some of you, some of you remember because I told uh, Sunday morning I talked about this, um, but in 2000, so all the way up until 2007, nobody knew where he was buried. They knew he was buried on that hill somewhere. We always thought inside the hill. So we've been looking all through inside that hill. Randall had been over there for a long time. We went over and, and and kind of crawled through there with him, uh, trying to find that. Could you find Herod's tomb? We actually walked right past some of this stuff. None of this was excavated then. And yet in 2007, they found it, right? They found it, and it was, uh, um, Netzer is the guy's name that found it. And uh, it was a major event to find the tomb. We, had, we knew from history that when they found the tomb, it's going to be destroyed. They, they do know what happened. Herod was, Herod had the, uh, uh, he knew that when, he knew he was dying. And he knew that when he died, nobody was going to mourn him. And so he had one of his sons and then had his sister. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Jericho. I want you to take all the, 
all the rich people, all the, the, no, the people that are known, all the people that are popular. I want you to arrest every one of them and hold them together. There's a little theater there. I want you to bring them in the theater and hold them there. And then when I die, I want you to kill every one of them. And that's what he, he told his sister to do this. I want, you to kill all, I want you to kill them all. So they arrested him, waited for him to die. When he died, his sister let them all go and they had a party. All right, so that did not happen the way he thought it would go down. And it was only a few years later that they went up on this, his monument, and busted up his tomb in that, right? Just because there was so much anger towards this guy. So they knew that when they found it, they're going to find a busted up tomb. And that's exactly what he found. I am glad this guy right here found it uh, because he's the guy, he's the guy that should have found it because he's the guy that gave his life on that mountain. This guy was there. If you, whenever you went on that mountain, there's a couple places you would find him. And this is, this is number one. You'd find him there looking for Herod's tomb and praise God that he found it. Interesting thing about this guy, and this became a, a major event. Israeli Museum now has this display and some more artifacts from what was found there. Um, but uh, the sad thing is, is you'll see this little picture now when you first walk in there and notice the date on here. This is when he was born. This is when he died, 2010. He found it in 2007 and 2010. He was up on uh, over this over this excavation, he was up high enough that it was probably about five stories up, that height. And he's up there and he's talking to one of his students and it's a rickety two by four uh, little rail that he had there. And that rail was there. I was there probably six months after he died and that rail was still there. You could still see right where he fell. And that, that rail was there. He was leaning on it, talking to one of his students and he fell. The rail gave way, he fell and, and fell to his death right exactly where he found Herod's tomb is where he died. Okay, that's kind of a, you know, the irony of that. And so, you know, I went there, it was about six months after that, uh, we were there and that railing, it's still right where he fell, was still there. It's like, you guys need to fix that, you know. A guy died there. The main archaeologist died there. So, okay, Herod's tomb. Let's see, let's not do this. Okay, we're going to go from there. This is where I'm going to start next time. I'll be nice to you guys. I could crash course this thing and throw this at you really fast. But this is really cool because we're going to move down to Hebron. Hebron, a place that I, we do. Here's why. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you what we tell you and what the reality of it is. This is what they tell you. No, I don't tell you this because I don't lie to you. But this is what they tell you. We, go, we don't go to Hebron because it's not safe. It's really not safe for the buses to go down there. It's just, that's why we don't go to Hebron. That's not true. The reason we don't take, we don't take tours to Hebron because it takes too long, right? I, we gotta, we've got to have it almost a full day to get you there, see what we need to see and get you out of there. And, you, and if you go to Israel, you know it's fast-paced and you can't eat up a day for that, right? But Hebron is very cool. Hebron has a couple sites there. It has Mamre, which is not a site that you're going to see on the average tour. Mamre is where Abraham had his tent, you can see exactly where his tent was. You can see where the, where the Terabith tree was. It talks about his, he is camped under a, a major tree there. You can see exactly where the tree's at, exactly where he was camped. And right now it's in a, it's, it's sectioned off. And I'll show you why it's sectioned off. Uh, sectioned off, but it's not a tour site, right? Okay, and so, and then I'll get you to a place that is a tour site is Hebron, the Cave of Machpelah. Okay, and we'll talk about who's, who's buried there. Okay, this is, if there's, if there's, okay, there's probably 10 places I want to break into in Israel, all right? And a couple of them I've been, I've been under the Temple Mount. I'm probably the, you know, there's almost none of us in the world been under the Temple Mount, so unless you're archaeologists. Okay, so there's a couple of places I have been in. This is one of the, if this would be high, probably number one on my list to break into is, the, is this in Hebron. Because in this, underneath this church, underneath this building that Herod built, underneath this building is, is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and, and all these tombs are still there. If I could just get the skull of Abraham, I would put it in our case. Oh, people come from all over the world. 
to see the skull. Oh, by the way, Jerome, going backtracking, I got to quit. Jerome, Jerome was, bar- you just, you just remind me of that. Jerome, uh, his daughter, in Bethlehem, back to Bethlehem, his daughter, his wife, and he is buried there in Bethlehem right next to the church, right? His wife and his daughter's tomb is still there. Jerome, guess what, guess what happened to him? He got dug up, and, and so now his head is in, um, where's his head? His head I've forgotten now what, what church is. His head has a church. His arm has a church. His leg has a church, you know, and all these, 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 these relics, these, these, you know, that's a fun study. Maybe, maybe before we quit this, I'll, we'll do, I'll do a study with you guys on relics because I love that study, you know. And so, yeah, there's a church right now that has Jerome's head on display, all right? So if you go, you guys that are going, to, Hubby's going to Greece with me this year. All right, that's cool. Just you? Okay, cool. I think we have uh, about 35 of you going. That's enough. But, uh, but you, you will have an opportunity to touch the top of a man that died about 600 AD. You, you're gonna, his head his head is in a case in one of the monasteries we're going to stop at. And just and they have the top of his head and you can see where people has kissed it. It's actually black from handprints and people kissing the top of this guy's skull. That's morbid. That's weird. And yet that's what they do. All right, so. I don't know who it is. It's, it's the patriarch for that particular church. So I'm not sure who it is. Yeah. But, uh, for them, it was a really the holy guy. The cool thing is, if you get a chance, now I'm rambling, and I'm one minute over, but here's the thing. If you get a chance to go to Rome, which you'll you'll be able to go to Rome, uh, to go to Rome, make sure you go through the tour there at the Vatican, and you'll be able to see, uh, you'll see Luke's finger. You'll see a skull from some, I forget now all that they have. They have a whole room of the relics, and you'll see, you know, the, the one I remember is just seeing Luke's finger. Just his finger bone, just this little finger bone right there. That would make a really cool necklace, you know. It's probably a chicken bone or something. Who knows what that is, right? So, all right. That's what happens. That's what happens when you go over time. You just start rambling about weird things. I did a study, and I'm thinking about uh, revisiting it on Sunday morning. I did a study on uh, what happened to the 12 disciples. And, uh, and it was one of my funnest studies I've done. And, uh, you know, who are they? What do we know in history? Just really, just really dug down on who are the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And uh, one of the fun parts of that study is to see what happened to their bones. And I'll tell you, the, 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 one of the greatest studies, and it's actually a really good study. There's a couple books on it now. It's, is Simon Peter's bones. It's at the, it's at the, they have that at the Vatican. It is, they, they found those. They know exactly where they at. They know exactly, they, they for sure, they're, they're probably the only set of bones that we know for sure. We have the bones of Simon Peter, all right? And it's really cool. And there's a couple new books out on that because some of this stuff is, is fairly new um, that they've let them do some research on this. Uh, you know, and you learn a lot about Simon Peter, about his age and, and, and kind of his health and that kind of stuff. And so that's cool. The Bones of Simon Peter, that's a book. I'd encourage you to get it. Uh, it's Audible has it online if you want if you listen if you listen to stuff uh, Audible books and so very cool. All right, I'm done. You're done. Yes, I know. Now we have now I just added another time another night for you guys. All right, okay because I got because this next section I don't know how many slides I got through. I got through uh, 78. No, no, I got through uh, 81 slides tonight. 81 slides out of 120. For you guys, so that's pretty good. That's good. I can't because the children's ministry people kill me. I know. <laughs> I went over last week. I got in trouble. All right, so I can't go over. All right, let's pray. You guys want to go home? I want to see you gone. All right, Father, we love you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you for your faith. Thanks for the things that we're learning, Lord. Thank you that we can laugh about this and learn some things, Lord. Some things we didn't know, Lord. We can learn and and Lord, just things that make our Bibles come alive. Now, when we think about Bethlehem. Not only we remember the wonderful story uh, of, of you, Jesus, being born in Bethlehem, but we think about the history of the church with Jerome and, and all that took place in that church, or Dirk Herod the Great, 
things that we learn, or Yad Vashem and the Holocaust, Lord. The things that we're learning as we come together. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. Trusting you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen.